Welcome to Weekly News Highlights, where we wrap up your week with a glimpse back into what went on over the past week. I'm Kim Dami in Seoul. Israel says Hamas used North Korean and Iranian weapons in attacks on October 7th. While Iran says it's ready to play a mediating role in releasing Israeli hostages held by Hamas under the condition that Israel frees 6,000 Palestinians held in its prisons. South Korean President Yoon suk spent this entire week in Saudi Arabia and Qatar in pursuit of economic cooperation and beyond with the two Middle Eastern nations. He returned home with nearly $79 billion worth of future projects. Four North Koreans across the inter-Korean maritime border in a small wooden boat on Tuesday morning, looking to a defect to the south. This is the first such crossing in four years, and investigations are ongoing to find out if their intention to settle in the south is genuine. Israel says Hamas used weapons made by North Korea and Iran during its October 7th attack. Meanwhile, Tehran expressed a willingness to get involved with hostages and negotiations, but stressed that Palestinian prisoners in Israel should be released in exchange. Lee Seung-ja reports. The Israeli military says North Korean and Iranian weapons, which included mines, rocket-propelled grenades and drones, were used by Hamas during its attack on Israel on October 7th. An Iranian mortar launcher and a North Korean-made grenade launcher were part of the haul of weapons recovered, with an official saying a total of 20 percent of all weapons used by Hamas during the attacks were from North Korea and Iran. Iran's foreign minister told the United Nations on Thursday that Tehran is ready to play a role in mediating talks to release Israeli hostages from Hamas along with Qatar and Turkey. However, he said in order for such negotiations to take place, Israel must be prepared to release 6,000 Palestinians held in its prisons. Meanwhile, according to Russian media outlet TASS, a delegation from Hamas visited Moscow on Thursday for talks on the release of hostages, including Russian citizens that the militant group is currently holding in Gaza. The Kremlin said Iran's deputy foreign minister is in Moscow to hold talks with Russian officials to discuss the ongoing conflict and find ways to stabilize the situation. Israel slammed the visit by the Hamas delegation, saying that Russia should expel them from their country while criticizing Russia for inviting them. Lee seung Arirang News. It's been almost three weeks since Hamas' attack on Israel sparked concern over rising economic uncertainty, especially in terms of volatility in energy prices and rising inflationary pressure. What scenarios could drive the economic impact of conflict in the Middle East? Our Shin Ha-young explains. Since the beginning of the Israel-Hamas conflict, all eyes have been on global oil prices, which can push up inflation both at home and abroad. Global oil prices jumped more than 4 percent on the third day of the Israel-Hamas conflict, which was the biggest one-day gain since April 3. However, even though oil prices rebounded as of Wednesday after prices fell on Tuesday for the third straight session, fluctuations have been less significant for the past few days. This came amid diplomatic efforts from a number of countries to release hostages. Also, Israel has not yet launched a ground invasion due to international pressure, alleviating concerns about disruptions in oil supply. But it's too early to predict the actual economic impact as it's uncertain how the conflict will unfold. Bloomberg Economics estimates that if the conflict extends to a war between Israel and Iran, it could push oil prices to $150 a barrel and drop global growth to 1.7 percent. This is because of Iran's proximity to the Strait of Hormuz, a vital oil trading route. If Iran disrupts oil tankers passing through the Strait of Hormuz or even blocks the strait, it could significantly impact global oil prices. This is because about 30 percent of the volume of the world's total oil consumption passes through that route. Meanwhile, unlike the Ukraine war, in the case of the Israel-Palestine conflict, the regime's contribution to global raw material production is not substantial. According to a report from the Korea International Trade Association, Israel and Palestine each account for less than 0.4 percent of South Korea's overall trade, meaning the effect is expected to be insignificant. However, the author of the report said it's necessary to diversify the supply chain of certain items.
South Korea heavily depends on Israel for key items, including bromine and airborne radar for aircraft. With an import dependency exceeding 90% for these items, a prolonged Israel-Hamas conflict could pose challenges for South Korea. Therefore, it is crucial to diversify the supply chain to secure alternative suppliers. He added that a prolonged war could potentially disrupt the supply chains in these advanced industries as Israel is a hub for this sector, where there are R&D centers and sales offices of South Korean firms like Samsung and SK Hynix. Shin na Arirang News. Four North Koreans across the inter-Korean maritime border on Tuesday, expressing their will to defect to the South. This crossing also had a South Korean military face criticism over surveillance of the Northern Limit Line area. Let's first turn to our Choi min -jong. Four suspected North Korean defectors have reportedly been found in a small wooden boat in waters east of Sokcho, Gangwon-do province. According to a government official on Tuesday, they had expressed their intentions to defect. South Korean military authorities have confirmed that the suspected defectors have been detained after the movements were tracked. A small wooden boat, believed to have come from North Korea, was spotted and tracked using coastal surveillance equipment. A JCS official said at around 4 a.m., the military dispatched ships and maritime patrol aircraft near the northern limit line after spotting unusual movement from the north. At around 5.30 a.m., an army radar detected an object moving toward the south steadily at a very low speed. An hour later, the military used a thermal observation device to track the boat, which was moving diagonally towards Sokcho. A fishing boat from South Korea had also spotted the boat in waters around 11 kilometers east of Sokcho and reported it to the Coast Guard. Questions are being raised as to why the military could not spot the crossing of the NLL. A JCS official explained that detecting such crossovers is difficult, as the NLL in the East Sea is over 400 kilometers long. The official also reassured that the military has been monitoring the boat closely after being detected on its surveillance equipment, and added that they have been cooperating closely with the Coast Guard and the Navy. A similar event happened four years ago when four North Korean fishermen defected to South Korea's Hamchuk port in the East Sea and were forcibly repatriated to the North by the Moon administration. Last May, North Korean residents defected by crossing the NLL in the West Sea. The government is reportedly confirming whether the intentions of Tuesday's defectors are genuine. Defectors undergo an interrogation conducted by a joint investigation team consisting of the military, police, intelligence authorities and the unification ministry. Choi min -jung, Arirang News. Like our Choi min -jung reported, Tuesday's crossing marked the first of a kind in four years and again, all eyes are on whether or not their intentions to defect are truly genuine. Now, that's why investigations under related ministries like Joint Chiefs of Staff and Unification are now ongoing, and they're expected to take around a month to draw a comprehensive conclusion. And there was a government data released on the same day that the number of North Korean defectors coming to the South more than tripled in the first nine months of this year compared to a year ago. Now, one apparent reason is a much relaxed environment now that the pandemic is over. Borders between the North and China have been reopened, allowing people to travel with fewer restrictions. And here's another possible reason. The situation in the North has become more difficult, so that people there feel like they have just one way or another to live or die. And the expert believes with eased border restrictions, more and more North Koreans will defect or attempt to defect to the South. We'll have to wait and see how the investigation will go for those four individuals. Over in Russia this week, Russian President Vladimir Putin reportedly has suffered a cardiac arrest, which had the Kremlin dismissed the report as a rumors. Now, the immediate denial followed the post that emerged on the Telegram messaging app on Sunday that Putin had suffered a cardiac arrest and that the Russian president was very ill and unlikely to survive, with all official meetings being conducted by a body double. Russian officials called the rumors an absurd hoax and said, Everything is fine with the president. Russian authorities released pictures apparently taken on the same day, showing Putin and Deputy Prime Minister Denis Mentrov in a meeting. 
Russia also announced the day after on Wednesday that Putin presided over a drill simulating a nuclear strike in an apparent move to almost prove that he is well. While the Telegram channel General SVR has made a number of claims about President Putin's health in the past, saying, including saying he has cancer, there are also analysis that it was a whole part of the Kremlin's strategic plot to draw and find out spies in their internal body by telling their officials and communication channels different news and scenarios. President Yoon suk was on a nearly week-long trip to Saudi Arabia and Qatar this week. And our Osuyang was traveling with the president as a part of the court and is in the studio today to break down the significance of that trip and what lies ahead. Welcome back, Suyang. Hi, Tami. So, Suyang, let's first uh, talk about the big outcomes of the two summits, which were mostly economic. But why don't you give us a rundown? Right, so one major part of President Yoon's Middle East diplomacy this time around was the economic agenda, of course, and that was strengthening energy cooperation to meet the challenges of the impending post-war era. And being some of the world's largest energy suppliers, Saudi Arabia provides around a third of South Korea's crude oil, and Qatar also supplies about a third of South Korea's liquid, uh, liquefied natural gas, or LNG. Uh, Korea is one of the largest victims of broken uh, global production chain. And it further gives serious impacts on Korean economy when it comes to energy, because Korea, Korean economy virtually imports 100% of its uh, energy use. So it is very important to guarantee stable supply of energy like crude oil and gas, uh, which is LNG from Saudi Arabia and Qatar. But as countries around the world aim for carbon neutrality, resource-rich countries need to seek out new streams of revenue, while oil importer countries like South Korea need to procure a stable supply of renewable energy. Uh, Saudi Arabia's economic future is uncertain in the 21st century, as all countries are pursuing clean energy use for decreasing carbon dioxide emission. That decreases demands for oil in the near future, and it became a largest concern to Saudi Arabia. So they decided to construct a technology-based economy before uh, oil demand disappears. This means that despite Korea and the two Middle Eastern economies facing a crisis over their current economic models, they also have an opportunity to join hands and build new sources of energy, transport, infrastructure and whole new systems to usher in the so-called post-oil era. That's why South Korea, with its uh, developmental experience and cutting-edge technology, is the perfect partner for the Middle East, according to Yoon, uh, especially to participate in Saudi Vision 2030 and Qatar's own National Vision 2030, which are all about diversifying their economies away from oil and establishing a new emerging uh, set of industries, really building up uh, smart cities, for instance, like Saudi's uh, neon megacity. With Saudi Arabia, there were 51 new deals and memorandums of understanding worth a total of 15.6 billion US dollars. This not only covers the $2.4 billion contract to build Saudi's major gas plant, but also cooperation on electric vehicles, hydrogen energy, defense, food, uh, and even medical products. Um, among them, a $400 million car assembly plant is to be built by Hyundai and Saudi's investment fund. And that's going to become South Korea's first EV production belt in the Middle East, uh, really providing inroads for South Korea's sales, uh, but also jobs and uh, very high quality vehicles for the Saudis. With Qatar, on the other hand, Korea signed 12 MAUs worth over $4.6 billion, including a $3.9 billion contract for uh, Hyundai Heavy Industries to build 17 LNG carriers in the country. The two sides also struck deals to cooperate on advanced technology, smart farming, uh, infrastructure, as well as culture, among other things. So, beyond trade expansion, why is it so critical at this time to really strengthen South Korea's relations with these Middle Eastern countries then? Right, that's a great question because, well, especially at a time of geopolitical uncertainty, um, economic uncertainty as well, uh, they're affecting countries all across the globe, uh, directly or indirectly. So the logic is really you need as many friends and partners as possible to safeguard against military tension spilling over, uh, trade protectionism and commodity and financial shocks to the system. 
As the world becomes more intertwined, the Middle East region is breaking away from traditional views of security and detente is being engaged in by many countries, even hostile ones. In such a situation, if we establish good relations with several Middle Eastern countries, our diplomatic prowess will become broader and more connected. In this situation, security is also strengthened, not only because if you're economically entwined, there is not much to fight about, but also in terms of having your friends in times of need, in the face of trouble. While having basically different views on the Israel-Hamas conflict, it is still possible and quite necessary for South Korea to stand in cooperation with key countries in the Gulf region to help de-escalate the conflict and also roll out humanitarian assistance. Second, at a time of trade protectionism and fierce global competition to lead the fast-evolving digital era, the economy is no longer a matter of relative wealth or scale, but it's a matter of national security for many countries. Without access to affordable and sufficient energy, South Korea's exports and the livelihoods of South Koreans are at stake. That's why we saw President Yoon make sure that Seoul procured energy supplies, overseeing a uh, crude reserve deal with Aramco as well. Then could it be that making friends with Middle Eastern countries could maybe benefit South Korea's push to denuclearize North Korea? Can you, could you say, would you say that? Well, I think uh, you could say that because while well, both Saudi and Qatar have uh, diplomatic relations with North Korea and they're also big influencers, they exert a lot of influence over their Middle Eastern neighbors as well, who may be enabling Pyongyang's nuclear missile programs, of course. Saudi Arabia, though, um, after Yoon's summit with MBS, he endorsed South Korea's audacious initiative towards North Korea and condemned any violations of UN Security Council resolutions on curbing weapons of mass destruction. Also for Qatar, President Yoon requested that the country cooperate with the international community's stern response to North Korea's illegal nuclear and missile development. And his counterpart reportedly expressed support for South Korea's policy towards the Korean Peninsula. So while all of this may not necessarily dramatically change the dynamics on the Korean Peninsula, it does build a pressure on the North Korean regime and it also strengthens uh, global resolve to effectively uh, enforce these international sanctions on the North Korean regime. And in terms of moving South Korea's relations with the two countries forward, there was also a large focus on future generations, like President Yoon addressing the, the youth at universities from both countries. Why is this so, why are Qatari and uh, Saudi gener uh, future youth so important to work with? Oh, well, it's the sheer size of the population, really, the uh, younger generation, rather. Uh, in fact, young people aged under 30 constitute more than half of the population across the Middle East and North Africa. So it's not really a matter of choice, but really a necessity if Korea wants to diversify its export markets and collaborate with young uh, entrepreneurial minds in the future, particularly given its own rapidly aging population. So in order to engage young people, President Yoon emphasized the interactions between Koreans and Saudis stretching back over a thousand years and their distinguished languages, uh, heritage, so some sort of discipline that really allowed their cultures to flourish and innovate. Thus, he pledged to increase academic exchanges and boost culture as a sector for cooperation with both Saudi and Qatar. The dynamism of the young population of the Middle East and South Korea could create a strong synergy effect. In that respect, I think the message we gave was positive. Our country has largely followed Western democratic values, but we also have some cultural sensibilities that are different from the West. I think these are areas that Korea and Saudi Arabia can share and thus feel closer to one another. In fact, Yoon officials noted that K-pop, KBT and K-movies, TV dramas, they're all becoming highly popular with young people in the Middle East, really opening the door for further commercial ties, travel and collaborations. Now, efforts are going to be made to increase these kind of people-to-people -people exchanges and tourism between the two sides. And for insights, I spoke with Chang chong woo who heads uh, Qatar Airways North Asia upon the 20th anniversary of flying to Korea. We operate a daily flight between Seoul and Doha. And we are now working very closely with the South Korean authorities to increase our flights in and out of Seoul to better serve the market as we do see robust demand inbound and outbound, especially since post-pandemic. 
Furthermore, you know, we also have a Qatar Airways cargo business, and they are operating four times a week freighter flights now between Seoul to Doha as well. And this is facilitating a lot of exports from South Korea to Doha and beyond to the rest of our network in the world. Well, it seems like important links between South Korea and Middle Eastern countries have been established during Yoon's trip. The first for a South Korean leader to these countries, right? That's exactly right, Tammy. In fact, uh, President Yoon, he gave out a very comprehensive joint statement uh, mm -hmm. after his summit with the Saudi leader. And we even saw the Saudi Crown Prince randomly turning up to give President Yoon a ride to the Future Investment Initiative mm -hmm. in his own black Mercedes Benz. Uh, then the Saudi uh, Crown Prince, he suggested that they ride the electric vehicle that would be produced from their uh, joint car plant with Hyundai the next time President Yoon visits Saudi Arabia. As for the Qatari leader, Yoon extended an invitation for an official visit to South Korea next year. And apparently the two countries have agreed to uh, coordinate this trip uh, through their diplomatic channels, according to the presidential office. Mm. Well, it does seem like the beginning of a long, solid partnership between South Korea and the Middle East. Thanks so much for your time today, Seung. Thank you, as always, Tari. South Korea has never been this close to becoming a cashless society, with mobile payment services heavily implanted in our daily lives. And here's how service providers are tailoring their market strategies to attract more users. Our An Song Jin has this story. As a tech-savvy country, South Korea is already well on its way to a cashless society. This was possible due to mobile or other payment services where customers enter a password to make payments using bank account information previously stored on smartphones. With the simple shake or swipe of a phone, payment has become increasingly more convenient for smartphone users. A report released by the Bank of Korea showed that the daily usage of mobile payment services for the first half of 2023 increased by 13.4 percent compared to the same period last year. Their various mobile payment providers, including big fintech companies, credit card institutions, or mobile service providers, where non-traditional bank tech companies take up nearly half of the digital payment methods. There is a lot of competition and potential for growth in this market, but in the future it could become a market where only the most convenient payment service provider dominates. Samsung Electronics, where the user base for their mobile payment service, Samsung Pay, has been rapidly increasing, is looking to replace the physical wallet with a digital one. Credit card companies are also trying to meet the growing needs of customers. We're focusing on our open payment strategy where we can interchangeably use other credit cards on our platform. We're increasing the number of shops that accept KB Pay through partnerships with big tech companies and franchises while also making it available overseas. As such, these mobile payment services are now stretching beyond the borders of Korea. For our users to experience the same convenience outside of Korea, we're focused on expanding the number of available countries on our platform, including cross-border payments where tourists in Korea could also use their own national payment platforms. Our service is available in 48 regions, and we're continuing to conduct research in order to understand user preference. But venturing overseas brings its own challenges. As companies target overseas markets, I think an important factor is to be able to easily resolve any disputes with overseas service providers. It's different from when a customer has issues during a domestic transaction. How these different payment services develop is expected to further drive South Korea towards a completely cashless society. An Song Jin, Arirang News. Here in Seoul, a seasonal tour returns to offer visitors the chance to indulge in a serene evening glimpse of Korea's first Western-style imperial palace. Our Shin Sebyeo was there. When the day fades into darkness, Seokjujan Hall illuminates Seoul's night. Located in Toksugung Palace in central Seoul, Seokjujan Hall completed in 1910 as Korea's first Western-style imperial palace. As its literal name, a hall made of stone, suggests, Seokjujan Hall is constructed entirely out of granite and bricks instead of the traditional wood and mud. On autumn nights, a unique tour of this historic building unfolds. The regular seasonal tour, dubbed Night at Seokjujan, takes visitors on a journey back in time. 
guided by hosts in traditional Chosun dynasty attire and accompanied by insightful narrators, visitors explore nine spaces. Stepping into Seokjujeon's central lobby, you're greeted by authentic furnishing and decor. Highlights include the emperor's bedroom, adorned in regal yellow, and the emperor's chamber, embellished with delicate plum blossoms. After the indoor exploration, the experience continues on an outdoor terrace, exclusively open for night tour visitors. Guests can enjoy tea and desserts beneath the soft glow of the autumn moon. Live classical music sets the mood, making the night a perfect blend of history and culture. The approximately one-hour tour includes an original musical made specially for this night tour. The performance features historical figures, Emperor Ko Jong, who built Seokjujeon, and Empress Myeongseong. I failed to secure a spot the last few times, but I finally made it, and it was worth the wait. The guide was fantastic, and the interior was just stunning. Opening up at night also made it even more special. From the warm welcome from those wearing traditional clothes to the regional musical, everything was enjoyable. Seokjujeon is a modern residence, but it has a lot of authentic Korean charm. It truly was a meaningful and enriching experience. Seokjujeon at night tours run until November 2nd, but reservations are currently closed. However, the night tour may return to greet more visitors next year. Shin Sebyeok, Adirang News. We thank you for watching weekly news highlights. Enjoy the rest of the weekend.